right, everybody. Sure. I think we're all good. All right. So we were on this diesel cycle problem three. Hopefully we'll get through this and move on to gas turbine engines. Um, so let's see. So we had derived our equation for our work net out um, in terms of delta H's and delta U's by applying our first law to each of those processes where we had um, where we had Q in and Q out. And the reason that we were using Q in and Q out was because our work net out term really had kind of three, three uh, terms, right? We had a, we had a work in from two to three. That was due to that uh, expansion during the heat addition process. We also had had a oh I'm sorry this is a workout I'm so sorry a workout from two to three we had a workout from three to four and then we had a, a work a work in from one to two and so rather than dealing with three terms and then also dealing with that volume term um, we decided to take advantage of the fact that for any cycle for any thermodynamic cycle the work net out is equal to the Q net in so perfect um so here we go oh and by the way before i forget there is a button that i added on the canvas homepage for office hours for the ta uh, so leandra will have office hours uh, actually after class today so there'll be office hours uh, i think he's planning on holding them on thursdays and fridays um, and it's different hours for each of those days but it's on that on that button on the home page okay all right, so we got our governing equation. So I know I need to go through and I need to solve for each of those temperatures. The only other thing that I might kind of worry about is the mass. Um, and so I mentioned at the end of class last time that might be a really good place to apply our, our ideal gas law because, you know, one of the assumptions with those uh, cold air standard assumptions is that air behaves as an ideal gas. So. Our ideal gas law would give us E V over R T. Um, and I just happen to know a lot of those properties at state one, right? And it won't matter whether I apply the first law, uh, whether I apply my ideal gas law at state one, state two, state three, state four, I'm just picking one because I, I know, like I know the volume at state one. And so it's just convenient. So that's all well and good. I'm actually gonna kind of, now he looks funny. Let's bring him over here. Just kind of put a little note that that's how I'm gonna, that's how I'm gonna deal with it. All right, so I need to go through and I need to solve for each one of those states. So let's do it. So state one. And I know I've got another thing to calculate. I need the mean effective pressure. I'm going to get to that shortly. Actually, I'll go ahead and sub here. Put this in. Put it in purple. So state one. I'm going to go ahead and I'd like to put all this stuff in Rankin. Um, so instead of writing that T1 is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, it is but I'm also going to put it in terms of degrees ray again. So 80 plus 460 would be 540 degrees ray again. And that's kind of it, that's all I need. All right, so now we've got state two. And I know from state one to state two, it was an isentropic process, um, so I'm going to go ahead and apply an isentropic relationship. And those are at the bottom of your equation sheet of the first page. And I've got three of them that I can use if I make the assumption that specific heats are constant. So I'm just going to make sure that I go over there and I'll highlight where that is. So it's the one that's circled probably from last time. That's the one I'm going to use. So this will be V1 over V2 T1. 
to the k minus one. So I've got k. Yep, it's not actually listed on there, but uh, k is cp over cv. You'll see it's 1.4. All right. So as long as my temperature is in absolute temperature units for T1, I'll get the correct T2. And I get a T2 of 17, 16 degrees Reagan. Perfect. And I just, I want to highlight things that I'm going to be using for that. Governing equation up there for my work net out. All right. So state three. So this is, um, you know, the previous problem I had like, I, they gave me what QN was. And so I could apply my first law and get things in terms of, of um, you know, of, of delta T's and, and that heat addition per unit mass. But for problem, whatever, problem three, that's not the case. I don't have what my QN so I need something that relates two to three. And the thing that I have is the cutoff ratio V3 over V2. So I can't use an isentropic relationship. The process of two to three, um, what can I use? I can use, I can always use my first law, but once again, I don't know what the QN is for that process, so it's not really that helpful, but I can also use my ideal gas law. And so that's the one that I'm actually going to focus on. So I need T3, so I'm going to write this as M R T over P V, and this is all at state three. And that's equal to one if it's an ideal gas, which means that it's also equal to one if I look at state two. So MR T2 over P2 V2. And there are some of these things that are gonna go away, right? Um, and in fact, I could, and I probably should have put it in terms of specific volumes. So R, T3 over P3, and instead of volume, it's specific volume. R, T2, P2, specific volume at two. And of course, there's gonna be some things that are gonna go away. The specific gas constants are gonna cancel out. And the other thing that cancels out is the pressure because from two to three, it's a constant pressure heat addition process. So P2 and P3 are equal to one another. And so now I've got I know that T3 is equal to T2 times um, V3 over V2, where that V3 over V2 is just your cutoff ratio. And so let's see what I've got. I end up getting a value of 3432. And that is also in degrees Rankin. Make sure that you put it in degrees Rankin. If it's going in the ideal gas law, it's got to be in degrees Rankin. So, okay, perfect. So that's one of the temperatures. And then the very last thing I need is state four. And so I know three to four is isentropic. And so I can use an isentropic relationship. So let's do that. Kind of the same thing if you look up at state two, very similar uh, strategy. So my T4 over T3 is equal to V3 over V4 to the K minus one. And of course, if I look up at my givens, I've got my cutoff ratio and my com 
compression ratio. Compression ratio gives me the, the relationship between the specific volumes at one and two, the cutoff ratio between two and three. Um, but I don't have anything that directly gives me the information from three to four. However, what I can do is I can say, well, I know that V4 and V1 are equal to one another. And at this point, it might not look like it helps me a lot, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be, I'm gonna put it in terms of V2. So you'll notice that, you know, I haven't changed this this uh, the value of what's in the parentheses there because the V2 would cancel it out. But what that has afforded me is I can now put this in terms of RC and one over R. And so that's super convenient because those are parameters that I do have, right? Those are things that were given to me. The R value, the compression ratio is 18 and the cutoff ratio is two. So it's two divided by 18 to the K minus one. And so I end up getting my T4, which is equal to 1425 degrees rank, uh, degrees Rankin. Yeah. Okay. So I think what I'm going to need to do, because I need to plug some stuff in. So I'm going to kind of give myself just a ton. bring him up here a little bit all right so I've got my work net out so I'm gonna take that equation right there and I'm gonna solve for what I need to so I work net out it's equal to the mass which is I defined it up there on the right hand corner upper right hand corner it's p1 p1 v1 divided by rt1 so let's do that. So P1, what was that? P1 was 14 points, just 14? It's 14, okay. All right, so it's 14 pound force per inch squared times the volume, which was 117. 117 inches cubed all right B over RT R is R bar uh, so I'm gonna put this as 1945 foot pound horse per pound mole degree Rankin over the molar mass of air 28.97 pound mass per pound mole times the temperature which was 540 degrees Rankin so just so we're clear, all we're calculating here is the mass where that specific gas constant is R bar divided by the molar mass times T1, and this is P1 and T1, or P1 and V1, I should say. And I think the only thing that I really need to do, make sure that my units are kind of cancel out and see what I need to handle here, so I do have some inches and cube stuff that I need to reconcile. So I will do that. Obviously we've got some inches squared. So that just becomes inches. So 12 inches, one foot. So this whole thing that's my mass. 
And I actually would like to get a number for that. So let's see, 14 times 117. Hopefully, I'm gonna, I just threw it in my calculator, so I wanna make sure you get something different, let me know. Zero zero four seven pound mass. So that's the mass of the uh, air within that combustion chamber. All right, almost there. Just want to like put some other. So now it's coming for this portion of everything. Okay. So I got a CP and my CP is that. CP is 0 0.240. 0 0.240. And this is BTU per pound mass. It's Rankin times this delta T. Um, T3 minus T2. So my T3, 34.32 minus T2, 17.16. Uh, and that would be minus, and it's minus CV. Um, so my CV, here we go. CV is 0.171. is BTU per pound mass degree Rankin and this is going to be 4 minus 1 T4 minus T1 so make this a little bit smaller so I can fit it all otherwise I'm going to be in trouble 1425 degrees Rankin minus 540 and I think I just barely made it There we go. All right, so let's make sure that our units are gonna cancel out the way that we want them to. So there we go. And then the only, there's an inch, there's an inch. There's the foot that go so I've got the pound mass over here which is going to cancel out with the pound mass over there and so all I should be left with is in in terms of BTU right so work net out ends up being 1.24 BTU All right, perfect. And I'm now again left in that same situation where I've given myself way too little room to actually work my problem, but that's okay. Magic, I'm gonna make it shrink. There we go. Let's put him right there. Now I, now I magically have room. Let's fix that. All right. So the next thing that I need to find, I need to find the mean effective pressure. And that mean effective pressure, it actually needs to be in PSI. So that's one thing that I don't think I put on my find, but they did say find it PSI. So I need to watch my units here clearly. All right, so that mean effective pressure, it is defined as work net out, which we calculated based on the Q net in, divided by the maximum volume minus the minimum volume. And the maximum volume 
is going to be before the compression the maximum one uh, I mean I'm sorry the maximum volume is going to be before compression and then the minimum volume is going to be right after compression so it's still going to be between v1 and v2 so this will be v1 minus v2 and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that in terms of just v1 because I happen to know that that's the 117 inches cubed right so this is going to be 1 minus and then I'm going to make this v2 over over v1 so that's v2 over v1 the reason is is because v2 over v1 is 1 over r and that just makes things a little bit a little bit cleaner okay perfect so let's let's do it so that mean effective pressure so it's work net out which we just calculated so we just calculated to be 1.24 BTU um, my volume 117 inches cubed and then this is 1 minus 1 over the compression ratio which was 18 if I don't if I'm not mistaken um, and of course I need it in pounds force per inches squared so I probably do need to get rid of this BTU so if I look on my equation sheet or my conversion factor sheet and let's go look at that real quick make sure we can see where this is there we go so I do have there we go right there so this is page five of that PDF so one BTU is 778.17 foot-pound force so we're getting closer so one BTU 778.17 pound force and of course my BTU that's going to cancel out um, and I think the only other thing that I need is for my for the inches to work out so one foot is equal to 12 inches and I think that will just about do it so inches becomes squared and so I should be left with pound force per inches squared or PSI. So I end up getting 104.4, 104.7, pound force or per inch squared or PSI. All right, and then there's one other video to watch just sort of wrap up some of the differences between um, the diesel engine and the gas engine and the way that we model those using the auto and the diesel cycle and why we model them the way that they that we do. Um, if you want to see this problem solved with air standard assumptions, there's also a video uh, on Canvas or a video on YouTube for that as well. And there's a clickable link in the guided notes for you up at the top here. Okay. I'll give you a, just a hot second. So, so far we've got two cycles under our belt for gas power cycles. Gas power cycles being, well, power cycle is it's operating between a hot and cold temperature reservoir, um, right? Re uh, yeah, operating between a whole hot and cold temperature reservoir, receives heat from, there we go. Right, so our model, which is a thermodynamic cycle, power cycle receives heat from a high temperature reservoir, that's our QN, 
um, and there is some waste heat there's your queue out and then the whole point of it is to generate power and that's your work net output work net out over uh, work net out minus work net in or work net out is equal to work out minus work in and then the gas power part of it is just the fact that your working fluid stays in a gas phase the whole time so we've got two of them um, gas cycle diesel and now we're going to talk about the gas turbine power cycle so this is a different setup so the auto cycle and the diesel cycle are both modeling reciprocating engines so um, piston cylinder type arrangements. So when we apply our first law, it's going to be that we're modeling it as a closed system, right? Um, that's not the case with a gas turbine power cycle. We are modeling it as, well, we're modeling it as a closed loop, but we are modeling it with um, devices, which when analyzed separately are analyzed as open systems. So, this is a picture of an actual uh, or a, a schematic of an actual uh, gas turbine engine. And this is kind of the, let's see, this is the model. So you've got a compression process, right? Um, you've got the combustion process. So you've got an air intake, the, the air is compressed, then that high pressure, high temperature air goes into a combustion chamber where you, uh, where it's combined with fuel and you have your combustion reaction. And then of course, those high temperature, high pressure gases are expanded over the turbine. And that's where you get your power output. And then re in reality, those, com those products of combustion uh, are rejected out, the, out, of the com um, out as exhaust gases. Now, our simplified model of that gas turbine engine, we're going to model it not like this sort of like, you know, it's not a closed loop, but we are going to model it as a closed loop. So, yes, we'll have a compression process. We're going to model that combustion process as a heat addition process, just like we did with the gas cycle and the diesel cycle. We're going to have... Um, a, a turbine where we get our work output or our power output and then the way that we're modeling our exhaust process is by a heat addition or heat rejection process just like we did with the uh, diesel cycle and the auto cycle so same kind of deal isentropic compression for the compressor from two to three it's a constant pressure heat addition process so p2 and p3 are equal to one another then from three to four ideally it would be an isentropic expansion process and then from four back to one where we're modeling that exhaust process we're modeling it as a constant pressure heat rejection process so the reason that it's drawn that heat exchanger is drawn with a dotted line is because it doesn't exist there's no physical heat exchanger there it's just what we're using to model it as uh, model that exhaust process in order to model this whole thing as a thermodynamic cycle all right um, another thing that we'll introduce is the concept of the pressure ratio so kind of like the comp compression ratio for the auto and the diesel cycle where it was in terms of specific volumes here we've got things in terms of pressures so um and then one other kind of side note is that all this stuff is physically connected they're right the compressor and the turbine they're physically connected and so the power output generated by that turbine some of it is redirected back to help drive that compression process as well and we relate the work output and the work input for those things using what's called the back work ratio so sometimes you'll be asked to find that back work ratio um, and so that's what that is but the equation is on your equation sheet for what that back work ratio is okay so here we go let's work the first problem so we have a simple brayton cycle uh, and has a pressure ratio of eight um so i went ahead and drawn my simple brayton cycle i've got a compressor i've got a couple of heat exchangers i've got a turbine so from one to two ideally you'd have an isentropic compression process 
Then from two to three, you'd have a constant pressure heat rejection process. Now what I typically do with these Brayton cycles, and especially when we start making modifications on the Brayton cycles, I will give you the schematic, right? So I'll give you all of the, you know, I'll show you, okay, from one to two, um, here's a compressor, then I'll have a heat exchanger drawn just like that, but it's gonna be up to you to know Am I, is this a heat addition process? Is it a heat rejection process, right? Is there a cue in, cue out, work in, work out? That'll be up to you. All right, so I've got a pressure ratio of eight. The temperature at the inlet is 300 Kelvin, great. And then it is uh, 1800, uh, 1300, I'm sorry, after that heat addition process. So that sort of gives it away, doesn't it? So this is our heat addition process. So I'm going to put this as a little Q in because I'll note, I've kind of noted that there's no mass flow rate or anything like that. So I really won't be able to find uh, a big Q dot. I'm supposed to find the back work ratio and the thermal efficiency. I'm going to go ahead and finish putting some Q ins and Q outs here. This guy, of course, sees a work output, it's a work input, and then it says, all right, solve the problem, all right, solve the problem, I'm going to say, making cold air standard assumptions, but there is a link to how you could solve it using air standard assumptions. It just takes a little bit longer. Um, and so, yeah, just for time's sake, I'll, I'll give you the video for that, but we'll go over in class just the cold air standard. All right, and says, with the exception to the fact that the isentropic efficiency of the compressor and turbine is uh, 0.8 and 0.85, really a little typo there, the cycle is ideal. So if I go over to my assumptions, there's some things I'm going to assume. Number one, steady state, kinetic and potential energy changes are negligible. And then I'm making, I should say, yeah, cold air, uh, oh. <laughs> well, darn. All right, so I'll just I'll just solve it using cold air standard assumptions. I'll say C D O for this guy, and we'll solve cold air standard assumptions on the right hand side, or at least as much as we can get through in the next 18 minutes. Okay. All right. So first things first. Each of those devices I mentioned, it's mo they're modeled. If I drew my control volume let's say just around this compressor here, it would be an open system because I have mass going in and mass going out. So let's recall what our first law is. So our first law for an open system in subscript convention, and it's on, if you want to, rem if you remember, I'll show you, go. So this is on, what is this, page four of those guided notes. You've got um, the first law for an open system in terms of subscripts. And actually, I'll just use this and I'll kind of mark things out. So one of the assumptions, we're going to make a couple of assumptions for all of these, that it's steady state and that changes in kinetic energy from the inlet to the outlet are so if it's steady state, oops, if it's steady state, the EDT is going to go away. And if the changes in kinetic energy and potential energy are zero, then those things are going to go away. So all you're going to have left, you'll have these terms to deal with, and then you'll have the M dot H's at the inlet and the outlet to, to contend with. So I'm going to take that equation right there and I'm just going to slap that up at the very top of my of my notes on the next page. So 
notice it's capital Q dot. So capital Q dot N minus dot actually just keep black and white. Dot in. It's Q dot out. Minus W dot out. Minus. Minus W dot in. Sum of the M dot H's going out minus the sum of the m dot h's going in. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get my governing equations on the left hand side, um, but then I'll translate that to what it means on the cold air standard because we kind of need to need to do it in that order anyway. So your back work ratio, remember this is the work of the compressor or compressors over the work of the turbine or turbines. All right, and you could put this in terms of W dots, that would be okay too, um, but for the compressor. Well, if you applied your conservation of mass, let's say, to each one of those com components, you would see that the mass flow rate is the same all throughout that loop, right? Steady state, one big loop, mass flow rate is the same. So M.1, M.2, M.3, M.4, they're all the same. So for the compressor, if I apply my first law, it's a work in. So bump, ba dump, ba dump. I would have the two negatives, so it is going to be M.1. Uh, let's see. Oh, two negatives make the positive, so it's going to be out minus n. So it'll be uh, the w dot n for that compressor between one and two is going to be m dot times h two minus h one. Okay. So h two minus h one. And for my turbine, well, it's a work output. So bump, but up. Not a work input. So there's a negative in front of that W dot out. So it's going to be the N minus out. So H3 minus H4. And because I've got these cold air standard assumptions, these things cancel out. Because I've got those cold air standard assumptions, then I can put this in terms of CP delta T. So I've got CP times T2 minus T1 and Cp times or, uh, or T3 minus T4, sorry. Okay, perfect. And I need my thermal efficiency. So my thermal efficiency, it is defined as big W net out over big Q in. And I could put this in terms of rates. So I'm going to. Right. So this is going to be any W dot out. Minus N E W N W dot N over Q dot N. Okay. And of course I can put the M dot, I can isolate him on the outside. So it's out. Let's work in because I've already got things defined in terms of that. So I've got the work out and the work in because I defined those things. The work out is going to be for the turbine. Work input is going to be for the compressor. So I've got those equations. And then the QN occurs between 2 and 3. So if I apply my first law to that heat exchanger between 2 and 3, well, 
It's not a work out or work in process. It's not a Q out, it's just a Q in. So my Q dot in is equal to the sum of the M dot H's coming out minus the sum of the M dot H's coming in. So it's gonna be out minus in. So on the denominator here, dot in, it's gonna be H3 minus H2. All right, then the other guys work out. That's for my, uh, my turbine, H3 minus H4. And my work in is for my compressor, H2 minus H1. And of course that M dot is gonna cancel out. And so I told you I needed that because all it means is it, it just simplifies a little bit. So if I make cold air standard assumptions, this becomes CP times T3 minus T4 minus T2 minus T1. And this becomes CP T3 minus T2. Perfect. And of course those CPs are gonna cancel out uh, but it's important to know that they were there and why they went away. Okay. Okay. So, perfect. All right. So, like I said, I'm going to just solve using cold air standard assumptions in class, but there is a video for air standard assumptions. And so there's a spot where you can walk through and solve using air standard assumptions, but... I'm going to just walk through on the right hand side, right? Solving with cold air standard assumptions. So you could see from my governing equations that the only things I really need are temperatures. So that's the only thing I'm going to be solving for on the right hand side. And there should be no need for me to really use those ideal air tables if I don't, you know, if I'm, if I'm making cold air standard assumptions. Uh, but with that being said, let's go ahead. So I got T1, I need T2. And you'll note that I've got a little spot for, T, for state 2S and state 2, and that's because I've got an isentropic efficiency that's less than one. So I'm gonna solve for things, for, the, for the, pro, the isentropic process from one to two, then I'll use that isentropic efficiency to get the actual state. So what I mean is I've got an isentropic efficiency, which relates the work for that compression process, ideally, I, the isentropic case, ideally we get a lot of work, uh, or I'm sorry, ideally, ideally we don't have to put in a lot of work to that compression process. So he's going to be on the top. So I'm going to put this guy over here because it really is in terms of H2S minus H1 over H2 minus H1, but of course we could put those in terms of T2S and T1 and CP times T2 and T1. All right. So I'll just kind of put a placeholder there because as soon as I find T2S, I'm good. The way that I'm going to find T2S is apply an isentropic relationship between state one and state two. So remember, you've got, got a couple of choices there. So instead of using the one that relates to specific volumes, I'm going to use this one. That was exciting. That went better. Okay, so let's go back over here. All right, so my isentropic relationship, I've got T2S over T1 equals P2 over P1. Of course, this is K minus one over K, my K being 1.4. And I've got the pressure ratio. I know what my temperature T1 is. It's just a matter of plugging things in and absolute temperature units. 
and so I've got a T2S value. Let's see. Five four three point four. So five four three point four Kelvin. So that's not really what I'm going to be plugging into my equation for my governing equation stuff, um, but I am going to use that T2S to find T2. So my T2 ends up. I don't know what is my T2. Maybe I can calculate it real quick on the fly. 543. And our isentropic efficiency was 0.8. Okay. I think 604 and change. 604.25, does that sound okay to y'all? Yeah, I don't care. I feel like I'm so done. <laughs> All right. Almost done. So, yeah, we've got our T3 here. That's what we're going to use to plug things in. Um, oh, where's my T4? Where's my state 4? Mess that up. So... Oh, no, that's fine. So T4S. Um, so from three to four, you've got this ideally isentropic process, but of course you've got an isentropic efficiency that's less than one. So I need to figure out T4S and then I'm gonna get T4. So once again, you know, your isentropic efficiency of the turbine, it's defined as the ratio of the two works, the actual and the ideal or the ideally isentropic process. Ideally, you're going to get a lot of work out of that expansion process, so that'd be on the bottom. And this becomes H3 minus H4S. This is H3 minus H4. Or Cp, T3 minus T4. This is Cp, T3 minus T4S. Perfect. And so hopefully we'll be able to find T4. Perfect. All right. So isentropic relationship here because three to four is through the turbine and ideally it would be isentropic. So T4S over T3 equals P4 over P3 to the K minus one over K. So you are not specifically given that pressure ratio. However, remember P2 and P3 are the same. So are P1 and P4. And that's one of the assumptions. That's one of the, the, the things that comes out of those ideal air or those air standard assumptions. One part of that is that there's no irreversibilities, right? With the exception we met, we said of those um, isentropic efficiencies. But with the rest of the cycle, there are no internal reversibility, irreversibilities. And so there's no fluid friction to ca cause a pressure drop from two to three and from four to one. So the pressure ratio is just, what, one over eight. So our T, oops. T4S ends up being 718. Okay. And so let's see. So I think we've got 805.3 for this guy. All right, and so it really is, it's plug and chug for your back work ratio and your thermal efficiency. There's no 
nothing, you know, no unit conversions or anything like that. Um, you should get somewhere around 26, 27 percent for the thermal efficiency and then the back work ratio around 60 percent when you plug those temperatures in. But it's the highlighted ones that you're plugging in. And once again, the air standard assumptions, that's solved online. So um, next time we meet, which will be next Wednesday, um, we'll talk about regeneration. So just be prepared for that. And fingers crossed for snow. I don't know. We'll see. All right. That's all I got. Y'all have a good day. Remember, there's office hours after this with the TA if you would, uh, if you want to go. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.